Well, hello everyone, welcome. I'm Ingrid Spencer, I'm the Executive Director for AIA Austin and the Austin Foundation for Architecture. I wanna welcome you to this event, the Women in Preservation Architecture, hosted in partnership with Preservation Austin. AIA Austin is the Austin chapter of the American Institute of Architects. And the foundation is our sister organization focused on public outreach, Together we advocate, advocate for our community's built and natural environment and the work of Austin's design community. We also produce public programs, exhibitions and experiences that increase awareness and appreciation of Austin's architecture and design and celebrate and cultivate design and placemaking leaders to demonstrate the power of design excellence. So today to introduce our speakers and to tell you more about Preservation Austin and what you will experience this evening, I'd like to introduce Preservation Austin's program and outreach planner, Megan King. Megan, take Thank it away. You. Thank you, Ingrid. Yes, as, as Ingrid said, I'm Megan King, Preservation Austin's uh, programs and outreach planner. And I'm so happy to be here and to share this space with AA Austin, Austin Foundation for Architecture, um, and all of our lovely speakers tonight, uh, Ellen Colfax, Terry O'Connell, Emily Little, Delia Miave, and Holly Arthur, oh, excuse me, Holly Arthur, whose incredible Preservation Merit Award winning projects you'll hear about tonight. It's an honor and pleasure to be among Austin's most accomplished and talented women practicing in preservation architecture today. I'd also like to thank our generous public program sponsor, Colin Corgan, for making this event possible for us. Um, a quick note of housekeeping, Zoom allows you uh, to have different speaker views, which you can toggle in the right top right corner. A portion of this program contains multiple speakers, so you, you may wish to adjust that setting to your liking. After the pre presentations, we'll be hosting a Q&A session with our speakers, so please enter any questions that you have throughout in the Q&A box down below. We'll also be recording this presentation to share on our social media channels in the following weeks. So be sure to follow us there to stay up to date. We are at Preservation Austin on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I'd like to start off by welcoming our Preservation Austin members in attendance tonight. Thank you so much for supporting the work that we do to empower Austinites to shape a more inclusive, resilient, and meaningful community culture through preservation. If you're not yet a member, I highly encourage you to join us at preservationaustin.org. While you're on our website, you can check out the host of amazing programs and initiatives that our organization has going on, including our 2021 virtual homes tour, Rogers Washington, Holy Cross, Black Heritage, Living History, premiering June 17th. We're really excited about this year's tour and hope you can join us. Tickets are on sale now on our website. And now on to tonight's program. As I mentioned, all three of the projects you'll hear about tonight have received Preservation Merit Awards for their exemplary work stewarding Austin's historic fabric. Established in 1960, our, pres our annual Preservation Merit Awards program honors visionary approaches to preserving our city's unique architectural, cultural, and environmental heritage. This year will be our 61st annual award season and Austin looks very different than it did back then as does historic preservation. So while we're still honoring the incredible projects that you might expect, our awards program offers an amazing opportunity to shine a light on a range of projects that represent the diversity of our city. Some recently awarded projects of ours include For La Raza, a multi-generational community-based meal restoration at the Holly Street Power Plant, Avenue C redevelopment in Hyde Park, a wonderful example of how to achieve density in a historic district, and St. Edward's Holy Cross Hall, a project that blends the contemporary and historic to gorgeous effect. By recognizing outstanding individuals, businesses, organizations, and institutions engaging in a plurality of diverse preservation projects, we hope to inspire others to carry on this important work. Each year, Preservation, preservation Austin selects a jury of professionals from the preservation design and nonprofit worlds to select exemplary projects within three award categories, preservation, stewardship, and special recognition. Calls for nominations for the 2021 award season will open up this summer and winners will be announced this fall. So if you have a project you'd like to nominate, I encourage you to join us on social media and sign up for a newsletter for the latest news on this year's awards. And so without further ado, it's my honor to, to introduce our distinguished speakers for this evening. 
First up, we have Ellen Colfax. Ms. Colfax has worked in Austin's Parks and Recreation Department since 2019, and prior to this worked for 10 years in the Historic Sites Division at the Texas Historical Commission, managing historic preservation pro projects at 22 state historic sites. A licensed architect, Ms. Colfax holds a BA in Archaeological Studies and a Master's of Architecture and Master of Science in Historic Preservation with a concentration in building conservation. She also worked in the Chicago office of Vinci Hamp Architects, but her love for Austin brought her back to Texas. Now managing restoration projects on historic resources in Austin's beloved parks, Ellen has found her dream job. Ellen will be speaking tonight about her work at the Scheidt Park Shelter House in Hyde Park, which won a preservation award for rehabilitation in 2020. Terry O'Connell grew up in Austin and never once tried to leave. Most of her 36 year architectural career has been focused on the restoration of public buildings, including several historic courthouses at the governor's mansion. She created O'Connell Architecture several years ago to shift focus to the rejuvenation and restoration of commercial buildings and homes in central Austin. Terry works to extend the lives of older and historic buildings through restoration, repair, new additions, adaptive use, energy conservation, building system integration, and improvements to life, safety, and accessibility. She appreciates buildings as functional works of art that tell the unique history of a community or family in a way that nothing else can. Terry will be speaking tonight about her firm's work at the Buas House in West Austin, which was awarded a preservation award for restoration in 2019. Emily Little has provided leadership in the preservation and design community in her native Austin for over 35 years. With an emphasis on the adaptive reuse of historic structures, her work has indelibly colored the fabric of Central Texas. In, eight, in 1982, she founded Emily Little Architects, a predecessor firm to Clayton and Little Arch Architects. At Clayton Cordy, she remains partner emirata and is focused on community-oriented and historically significant projects. A native Austinite, Delia Miave is, a pa is passionate about historic preservation and adaptive reuse projects that highlight and cultivate the cultural integrity that is so highly coveted within the Austin landscape. With over 14 years of experience in design, she approaches projects pragmatically to ensure building code and zoning regulatory compliance, realistic schedules, affordable value engineering solutions, and quality and thorough architectural documentation. Delia worked at, for Clayton Cordy Architects numerous times throughout her career, first as a seasonal intern and then again as a, as a project manager, totaling six plus years of service. She studied historic preservation at UTSA while getting her master's of architecture and holds a Bachelor of Environmental Design from Texas A&M University. Holly Arthur is the founding principal at Studio Ha with 20 years experience in, in managing commercial, residential and preservation projects. She received her bachelor's degree from Texas A&M University and her master's from the University of Texas at Arlington. Holly lived and worked in Vancouver, British Columbia for several years, working with the prestigious firm Bing Tom Architects and Dialogue. She then returned home to Texas to work with the local award-winning firm Clayton Cordy. Her, di her diverse creative background allows her to find success in various types of projects. Emily, Delia, and Holly will discuss their project with Clayton Cordy at Commodore Perry Estate, honored with a preservation award for rehabilitation and cultural landscape in 2020. And so with that, I will now let Ellen take it away. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome. I'm very excited to be here tonight. First, I'd like to say how much we appreciate receiving the Preservation Merit Award from Preservation Austin for this project. From everyone at Parks and Recreation, um, but especially from the Historic Preservation and Heritage Tourism Program led for, by Kim McKnight and the team that works hard to preserve, interpret, and promote PARD's historic resources, we say thank you. Tonight, I'll give you an overview of the restoration of the Scheidt Park Shelter House. This simple building is dear to the surrounding neighborhood and community, and it's an important part of the history of Austin's parks as one of a handful of shelter houses built in the 1930s. A historically significant structure, it's a contributing resource to the Hyde Park Historic District listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Located in the Hyde Park neighborhood, north of the University of Texas campus, 
and the rustic log shelter house was built in 1930 in the newly acquired park to provide restrooms, storage, and a wide dog trot breezeway for recreation and performances. The design of the building is attributed to Hugo Cuny, a notable Austin architect who served on the city planning and zoning commission, as well as on the park board and designed many commercial, public and residential projects throughout his years of practice in Austin. Uh, the photo in the center, the university stu studio photo show, shown here, um, was one of several professional photos taken of shelter houses, and they are part of CUNY's personal papers in the collection at the Austin History Center. Um, here on the left in the inset photo, you can see the popularity um, of the new park uh, showing a community night gathering in 1931. Following a national trend promoting organized recreation, the Koch and Fowler 1928 City of Austin plan included a detailed section calling for the need of municipal parks. From this, the City of Austin Parks and Playground Committee formed with Hugo Cuny as vice chairman after municipal parks began to open in 1929, the newly appointed Director of Recreation, James Garrison, sought to construct park shelters that were suitable for their intended recreation function. The early shelter houses in parks from this time period are attributed to CUNY under Garrison's direction to make them appropriate not only for athletics, but also for programming such as pageants, dancing, crafts, and dramatics. Shown here are three other shelter houses from this time period, each with a different architectural style meant to reflect the character of the surrounding neighborhood. The minimalistic structures mark a significant moment in park expansion and recreation theory for the city of Austin. Here's a photo from 1941. The Scheidt Park Shelter House is unique among the other PARD shelter houses because of its rustic cedar log exterior. The design seemed to emphasize the nature of the surrounding Hyde Park neighborhood when it was built, and some local sources attribute it to a log cabin that stood on Avenue G um, at the time of its construction. Here, crowds from the surrounding neighborhood gather to enjoy the stunts of a diving show in the pool. And um, you can see the kids didn't hesitate to climb to the roof to get um, a better view of the show. Look closely, um, if you look very closely at this photo, you can see that it is actually a double exposure. Um, so the, the view of the pool with the diving stunt is superimposed over the view of the crowd watching the pool. The log shelter house provided a backdrop to the activities in the park throughout the decades. In the photo on the left from 1960, you can see changes in the playground with concrete ping pong tables under the trees. And then in the photo on the right from 1972, a hula hoop activity um, showcases a boy who went to Disney World for the national competition. Recently, as planning moved forward to address replacing the Scheib Park pool, the well-loved shelter house was also showing its age. Um, a conditions analysis report completed by Limbacher and Godfrey Architects in 2016 provided research into the building's history and identified many of the building elements in need of restoration. Starting in 2019, the restoration work that I oversaw was distinct from the pool project and included repairing the log walls, re replacing the chinking and the daubing, restoring a damaged window and the cedar shake roof, as well as replacing the exterior lighting. Phoenix One Restoration and Construction was the general contractor on this, for this work.
Here are some of the photos of the log repairs. Uh, the cedar log walls have saddle notched joints and so several of the log ends had broken off at the corners. Guided by the National Park Service recommendations and preservation brief number 26, which is called the preservation and repair of historic log buildings, Dutchman repairs were used to splice in new wood where the log ends were missing and entire logs were replaced where the deterioration was severe throughout. The crew from Phoenix One had, has experience working on cabins 100 years older than this one and their skill was needed to make the repairs fit discreetly into the historic fabric. One of the, one might be hard pressed to find the repair um, in the left-hand photo. The log walls wrap a light frame lumber structure within the pens and therefore are a modern interpretation of a log structure. We don't know who, who originally constructed the building, but the restoration crew noted that it appeared that the 1930 crew were novices to log construction. And the building shows one pen with logs more expertly fitted at the base and then a transition of technique in the rest, almost like the foreman who trained the crew had left them to finish the job with their newly acquired skills. The photo on the left shows a, um, a Dutchman repair onto the end of the log about three quarters of the way up, you can see it. And then the photo on the right shows two logs that had to be replaced entirely. In keeping with the rustic log style, simple window openings with cedar louvers provided ventilation and privacy for the unair conditioned 1930s park restrooms. One of the windows on the north facade had been damaged by a fire, charring the louvers. Uh, since the restoration's emphasis was, ret was to retain as much of the original building materials as possible, the carpenter carefully salvaged the frame and replaced only the burned louvers and one jam. New cedar was cut to match and the louvered sash was reinstalled. And all of this work had to be done prior to the daubing installation in the log walls. So on the left, you see the damage on the right, the, the restored. Replacing the chinking and daubing was also part of the restoration scope. Um, the chinking refers to stones and other solid materials that were that fill the larger gaps between the logs and provide a backing for the daubing. Traditionally, stones and pieces of wood were wedged in place as chinking. Um, stainless steel nails or lath are also acceptable chinking material and were used in this project. Um, in traditional log cabins, the daubing or mortar-like material used to seal the openings between the logs was made of mud mixed with dried grass and needed seasonal maintenance and replacement. And in some instances, the daubing was removed intentionally to allow breezes to ventilate the building in hot seasons. In this building, the daubing was cementitious and multiple repairs have been made throughout the years with different types and, and colors. Um, the original had a dark brown color that was difficult to reproduce. Um, the two photos on the left show rejected samples, although some were very close to, the, to correct. And um, to the right, this photo shows the mock-up that was approved and a sample of the original daubing um, on the upper right corner wedged between the logs. Here are images of the cedar shake roof being installed. The shakes were um, installed over a ventilated uh, underlayment and the courses were interspersed with strips of felt as recommended by the Cedar Shake and Shingle Bureau. Copper flashing was used at the valleys and the drip at edge. Um, in the photo on the right, you can also see the new exterior lighting that was chosen to complement the style of the building and provide light at the restroom door.
And here are a few after photos of the exterior um, showing the west elevation on the left and then on the upper right, um, another wall within the dog trot. And here it is completed. This project wrapped up in mid-February 2020, um, just prior to the beginning of the pandemic. An event planned to celebrate the completion had to be canceled. Um, and this photo was taken in the summer of 2020. It really takes the hard work and varied skills of so many people to guide a project to reach a successful completion from the advocacy, funding, design, management, and craft going into a project. So many are behind the scenes, but integral to the project's success. Here are representatives from the two groups that equally funded the restoration work, the Austin Parks Foundation on the left and Friends of Shite Park on the right. Um, well, we've come to the end of my project summary and thanks so much for listening. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Terry O'Connell. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this presentation today. I'm Terry O'Connell with O'Connell Architecture. I'm here to tell you today about the John Otto Buis House restoration at 806 Baylor Street. Um, the house was uh, constructed, our project started in 2016 and it was completed in late 2018. Well, our firm was the restoration architect, Bill Hablinski Architecture. Uh, did the new design work on the back of the house, and Joe Pinelli was the general contractor on the project. Next slide. And um, this house has an amazing history. The family itself, the Buis family, has been in Austin since 1851. John Lawrence Buis and Helen Bastain Buis uh, came to Austin in 1851, and uh, started their family here and created businesses. Uh, and they had a son, John Otto, who married Alma Buis, and they had two sons, Otto Hugo, Hugo Buis and John, and John Lawrence Buis Jr. Um, we were able to find all of these wonderful photographs through Ancestry.com as we were doing the genealogy of the family and to try to find out more, more about the history of the family. Next slide. The John Lawrence Buis had a beer garden on uh, West 6th Street before that was cool. Um, or maybe he started the whole movement. Um, it was around the area of Flower Hill. Um, and it was right down the street from his own house. I'm sorry, this is a terrible image, but it's the only thing we could find of the, of the this is a rendering of the, the uh, beer garden that he had there on West 6th Street. Next slide. John Lawrence Buis, uh, his family home is uh, located on Patterson Avenue, 708 Patterson Avenue. This is the house as it sits today. It is an Austin landmark as well, and it's been changed over time, but, um, but it's an Austin landmark. So it's on the property sort of uh, cat corner from the street. Um, it's kind of interesting sighting because obviously it was built before Patterson Street was constructed. And so it looks like it sits oddly on the street, but really it just faces down to 6th Street and they had the property going all the way down to 6th Street at that time that connected over to the beer garden. Next slide. So um, John Otto Buis, their son, uh, created his uh, Buis and Sons uh, construction company and general contracting. They uh, were a very successful business. Uh, they, they marketed materials in their store, including galvanized iron cornices, pressed metal ceilings, furnaces, and roofing copper. In fact, this company was installed the first copper roof on the state capitol, and then 40 years later, installed another 
roof on replaced the copper roof on the state capitol. They went on to be in business for over a hundred years, and the company finally closed um, in the early 1980s. They were uh, leaders in the community, both uh, John Otto and his sons, and then their children were leaders in the community for years and years. And they won all sorts of awards from the Chamber of Commerce and uh, local community leaders for their business and success over the years in their business. Next slide. Um, so this is a historic photograph of the John Otto Buis house. I mentioned to you that we had done some family genealogy. Uh, what we have found to be really successful, if we can find uh, the genealogy of a family, a lot of times a descendant will be on ancestry and have historic photographs of the family home. Um, we couldn't find it that pathway in this particular project. And so I resorted to Facebook because Buas is such an unusual name that I, I looked at uh, Buas in, on Facebook to see if anyone was around with that last name. And it turns out we had a mutual friend uh, in Ann Wheat, who some of you all might know, um, she's been very active in the Austin History Center Association for years and years. And so I had a little introduction to the family through Ann Wheat and through Facebook and was able to uh, have the most amazing conversation with his mother about what she remembered of this house. And she shared historic photographs, two historic photographs of the house that proved incredibly invaluable to the reconstruction of the historic front porch. So as we're looking at this here, you can see all the original windows and the shutters. The second floor shutters are closed. That's what, you know, the, the shutters were closed to um, keep the house cool in the summer uh, a lot of times to get the keep the sun out of there but you can see in this photograph we've got the um uh wire fence that's right at the sidewalk level and then further back there's a fence that was probably there to hold in um livestock or 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 define a garden area it was it was meant as more of a, a functional barrier rather than a beautiful barrier like the front wire fence um, we've got the, the family sitting on the front porch here in this photograph, and you really get a good sense of all the ornamentation at the roof, the finials, the chimneys, the, the uh, ridge cresting, the widow's walk, the iron cresting at the witch's hat at the corner parapet, which we'll see a more, more of in a little bit. All of this detail was gone when we started this project. So this photograph and the one that's coming up next, next slide, was um, they were incredibly valuable to us as we went to reconstruct these um, missing historic features. So this one's also charming. You can really get a sense of the exposed Austin common brick. That brick had been painted for years and years when we started the project. Um, but we really get a sense of, you know, that the mortar joints were articulated in this, um, in this image, and we get a sense of the different shades of the color palette and the families enjoying being out there on the front porch. And we can see that this was um, before cars <laughs> were available. Um, the house was constructed in 1902. It was the first house on its block uh, at at the court at uh, between 8th and 9th on Baylor Street. It was the first house on its block. So you can see a lot of uh, land around them that they enjoyed prior to the construction of the rest of the neighborhood. Next slide. Um, so looking here at um, some of the details of the house, we zoomed in in Photoshop and were able to really hone in on the details, the ridge cap, the umbricated shing uh, slate shingles on the roof. All of this was, was not existing when we started the project. Um, you can see, interestingly, there's a little downspout uh, coming off of that 
upper level porch that drained it. Um, and that's interesting. We, we ended up pretty much recreating that, even though it's not incredibly beautiful. Uh, we were, we were true to that drainage. Um, it was a good way to drain the porch. So there you go. <laughs> um, we also uh, could see the height of the original chimneys. Um, the chimney that you see in the lower right-hand corner had been lopped off, but it was about half as tall as it shows in that photograph. So we were able to count bricks and um, reconstruct that chimney to match the original appearance. Next slide. So this is the way the house looked um, on the left when we started the project. It was obscured by this um, enormous, uh, aggressive, soft wooded tree that was um, in danger of collapsing anyway. It had been subdivided into six different apartments over the years, uh, starting in the 1950s, it just kept on being subdivided more and more. And so the second floor porch had been enclosed. Um, the, the first floor windows had changed. You can see there's three windows there at the first floor. Um, and historically, there were only two window, uh, one window there, excuse me, one window there, large window that we went back and reconstructed. We still have the original front door though, which is great. And we still had the original uh, cornice detailing around the top of the porch, which you can see with the little um, medallions that were articulated. The columns were all uh, still there at the first floor. We reconstructed them at the second floor, but the first floor columns were all there. Uh, the handrails had gone. Uh, so we were able to reconstruct those, but you can see, remnants of the original building, uh, but uh, a lot of it um, needed to be reconstructed based on the historic photographs that we saw. You can also see down at the lower uh, right corner how sad the poor thing looked after we cut down the large tree that was obscuring everything and then we realized how, um, you know, how much help that the building really needed. Next slide. We started with a condition assessment and we went through with a fine tooth comb. You can see here, this is the third floor balcony at, coming out of the attic. Um, some really charming uh, French doors that were very thin and very fragile um, led to the uh, third floor balcony. And uh, you can see that all of the slate shingles had gone, they'd been replaced with composition uh, shingle roofs. You can see the shorter chimney that I was telling you about from the previous photograph. This is the shortened chimney that you see at the top right hand corner. At the top of the roof, um, where historically there was a widow's walk, uh, a, a skylight had been put in its place. They had finished out the attic space as living space. It was a really interesting apartment. We'll see some more photos in a minute of this space, but they had brought light in uh, with a skylight up here. Um, so next slide. You can see here this, this uh, on the left-hand side is the apartment up at the third floor. Uh, the way uh, it was when we started work. They had done a lot of structural reinforcing to open up the space. They had a not, lot of light coming in through the skylight. Um, and then but the, down uh, at the first floor, uh, you know, there had been a lot of changes to the building. Several kitchens had been added, of course, several bathrooms, several later finishes of tile and sheetrock and, and um, obstruction of historic features and finishes uh, throughout the house that had occurred over the years. Next slide. Um, the, there was a beautiful historic fireplace down at the first floor. This was in the uh, main uh, living room. As you entered the home, you would have seen this fireplace um, very quickly. On the right hand side, you can see there's a big blank wall here. Why would we include that? Well, they had put that wall in to enclose the original staircase. They had 
walled that staircase off and created a new entry on the front of the house for a second floor apartment entry uh, independent of this first floor unit. So we were able to take this wall down and reconstruct the historic floor. In this image, you, you start to see some of the pressed metal ceiling. We'll see more of that in the next slide, please. Um, one of the really wonderful things about this house was John Otto Buis, as you remember, uh, had galvanized metal cornices and ironwork and all that. He must have uh, just pilfered remnants of pressed metal ceilings from all of his projects or whatever models he had because every room had a different pressed metal ceiling pattern in it. It was really very charming. Um, and so you could, you know, there was there were some that were very unique. Uh, the red image here doesn't come out so well, but that was a kind of a flat uh, scrolled image, scrolled pressed metal ceiling. And then there were other more elaborate pressed metal ceilings in the rest of the house. We're looking at the, the main ceiling that I thought was so beautiful it was in the dining room and living room. And it had the full main field border, uh, you know, and, and cornices all around the perimeter. It was just truly a gorgeous ceiling. It had lead paint as most of these historic buildings do. So they were blasted with walnut shells to get the paint off of them carefully. And you can see on the right hand image here that we really didn't lose any of the original detailing at all. Um, came clean very nicely. Next slide. There was some historic detailing. Um, the original finishes inside the house were shellacked, uh, clear finished wood. Um, we, we did um, a little bit of paint investigation inside the house and found that finish underneath this newel post on the doors, on the frames. Um, and so that was, that was a lot of fun to uncover. And then at the apartment up in the attic, we also um, were looking at ways to reuse that space and still meet code requirements for head clearance and everything like that. So we were, we were looking at what to restore and what we could do to save um, as much of the original building volume as possible so it could be reused. Next slide. Here we're looking at the other side of that uh, window at the third floor. You can see the pressed zinc decorative metal at the gable end. And you can see this charming, charming Palladian window with this lovely air conditioner that's just, you know, really asserting itself in the, in the, uh, in the gable end, making a statement, which we removed. Uh, <laughs> we've also got the umbricated slate shingles at this gable end. These were the only remaining slates that were available for us to access um, in the project to know what the original slate finish was, which was a uh, purple gray uh, slate, likely from Vermont. We found a good match from Vermont. Um, the shell feature at the bottom here is, is a beautiful uh, pressed zinc feature. You can see Joe Pinelli over here at the top right hand corner looking at this after it had been after it had been abated with, from with lead paint and that was restored and put back on the building. It didn't really need uh, much reconstruction or repair at all. It was in really great shape. Um, so yeah, let's go on to the next slide. We did a paint analysis. Um, you can see a lot of the, you know, this this uh, green and red and and um, sort of a, a yellow ochre color. Um, those are typical of the historic uh, paint colors um, of the period from 1902. I looked under them to see what other colors we could find and found that really I think. Um, it was attempted to reconstruct the historic paint scheme as part of the most recent painting that these are, these are very close to the original paint colors that I found under many other layers of paint beneath them. It had been this color scheme 
originally. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. Um, it had been, uh, you, you can see here through our microscope, we've got layers and layers of paint, white paint over the original paint layers. Um, and so my thought was really that the um, paint scheme that they had up there at the beginning of our project was an attempt to match the original paint colors. But we were, we love to use the microscope to get in there and, and we, we've got an attachment to our iPhone that can, you know, really capture these images and really help illustrate to the client um, what the evolution of the building is. Next slide. Real quick, those are the historic paint colors. And then next slide, uh, the owner didn't like them. Um, <laughs> and so um, we went with, um, we went with a, a more neutral palette, uh, a soft beige and white, um, off-white to go, um, to fit with the architecture of the building. It, it was um, a paint scheme that had been used many times over the years and it was, um, you know, it's historically appropriate, but perhaps not the original paint scheme that was used. Next slide. One of the big things we did in this project was improve the thermal envelope of the building. We took down all of the brick and it was cleaned of paint, layers of paint. It was Austin common brick. Uh, it was cleaned off site and then relayed on the, uh, after we installed a uh, vapor barrier on the exterior sheathing. On the right-hand side here, you can see the vapor barrier that had been adhered to the exterior sh sheathing, original sheathing, and then the brick was relayed on top of that. It's very important to integrate a vapor barrier in an assembly like this if you're going to insulate the walls, because if you don't do that, then it's going to affect uh, it's going to create abilities for mold to grow and the building to uh, deteriorate more quickly. So we put the vapor barrier on, we insulated between the joists down and the walls down below with Roxel, um, which is a mineral fiber insulation. And then at the attic space, uh, they did spray foam at the roof. Uh, at the roof level, open celled spray foam so that it wouldn't um, seal water in up at the roof deck level. Next slide. Um, we Here's some images of reconstruction of historic features. And I think I'm running on my low on my time. So I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, we reconstructed historic features based on photographs and physical evidence on the columns. Um, we took the columns apart and, and cleaned them up and repaired them and put them back in place. You can see the finials getting, uh, the, the posts of the railing at the third floor getting installed at this lower right-hand corner. Um, those were fabricated uh, out of resin, as a matter of fact, because it's such a vulnerable location up there. We wanted it to be something that would be more durable over time. Next slide. We have, um, you can see in the historic photograph that on the left-hand side that the original staircase looks like it was made of wood and that was very common. Our owner wanted something that would be more durable. And so I, I reconstructed the stair out of limestone, slabs of limestone laid in the same pattern as in the original wood stair. So it'll be more durable, but it, and it has the same, exterior appearance, but it's going to be a lot more durable over time. Next slide. Um, we also got a really wonderful photograph of the historic roof finials. Uh, all of that was missing, so we were able to recreate that and, and uh, you know, reconstruct these historic fe features and finishes in the project. Next slide. You can see how tall some of those finials are. That thing is six feet tall, but on the building, it completely scales correctly with the historic photograph. So uh, we, uh, we were able to uh, do that using Photoshop and perspective correction, analyzation of the features. Next slide. Um, there's the reconstructed balcony and finial and widow's walk. 
and the shell that we were talking about earlier at the windows. Next slide. Uh, we match the historic mortar in color, texture, character, and tooling, composition and tooling. And um, we reconstructed the historic shutters for the windows. The windows were restored. They were not replaced. Uh, next slide. And um, so all, all the windows were, were restored, like I said, and um, reinstalled in the building. Next slide. Uh, the shutters were recreated re, uh, by um, Gary Chernock out of uh, Weimar, Texas, who does wonderful work, and the shutters are holding up really well. A lot of people don't want to do shutters because they think they aren't very durable, but we found if you get really good craftsmen using mortise and tenon joinery, the shutters are going to last um, much longer. Next slide. Um, we have, um, I told you, Bill Hoblinski was the, the uh, architect for the addition. This is looking at the back of the house. Um, we have, he used metal windows for the new addition. He added a band, a steel band under the cornice to delineate where the new addition begins. And he changed, he nuanced several details in his design to, um, intending to defer to the historic building that uh, is, is presents at the front. And you really can't see any of his building from the main street. All of this that you see of the new construction is not visible from the street. Next slide. And this is our restored building at um, 806 Baylor. And I appreciate um, y'all's attention to this. And I'm going to turn it over to Emily Little and let me know if you have any questions at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. Thank you, Terry, and what a gorgeous project that is that you did. And you too, Ellen, thank you all so much. Um, we're gonna talk about the Commodore Perry, which uh, for many, many years has been sort of a hidden treasure in Austin. It's at the Northwest corner of 44, 41st and Red River. It's about a 10 acre site. And um, this mansion was built in 1928 by Edmund and Ludy Perry. And it, it was 10 acres at the time. The western boundary is Waller Creek. And it is said that uh, Commodore Perry selected this site because it was right across the street from the Austin Country Club at that time, which is now known as uh, Hancock Golf Course. So um, this is a current picture today after its recent renovation. And it, we're very proud that we also won a PA award for this. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna give just a few introductory remarks and show a few more images, but uh, the real presentation will be done by our, the workhorses of our team, which I'm proud to introduce as what I think of as the next generation of preservationists from our firm. Holly Arthur was project architect and Delia Mayave was project manager. Next slide, please. The amazing thing about this project, apropos tonight's topic, and um, is that once the team was assembled, um, every single consultant listed on this sheet was led by a woman. Every, every consultant team was led by a woman, I think except civil. And it wasn't intentional, it just happened. And I, I just think they did an incredible job and we're, extremely proud of the team that you see in front of you. Okay, next please. This is a 1930s photograph of the Perry Estate shortly after it was built. It was built in 1928, from 26 to 28, uh, the architect was Henry Bowers Thompson out of Dallas. And he was known for these Italian Renaissance villas 
He had traveled a great deal in Europe and so had Edmund and uh, Ludy Carey. And so they built this fabulous mansion and, and surrounded by these stepped terraces and formal gardens. So this is how it appeared shortly after it was originally built. Um, Commodore Perry was a self-proclaimed Commodore. And I imagine as, him as a great bon vivant and many of his relatives live in Austin today. So the, the Perry family and traditions carry on. Next, please. The life of the Perry estate has had two significant eras. The first we just saw of the mansion itself. Uh, he also had outbuildings, which were a carriage house. There was a bowling alley built on the property at one time. Here on the lower right, you see remnants of the formal garden. This was probably taken in the early 2000s. And, and you see the second, the evidence of the second significant era of the site, which was when it was St. Mary's Academy, a, a, a educational institution. And on the right, midway with the red roof, you see the chapel that they built, which is, remains on the site. Upper right corner, the L-shaped educational building, more educational buildings on the left. So the site became somewhat cluttered. And um, doesn't look like this today. Let's take a look at the next slide, which is a site plan of the eastern half of the site, which is the area of our concern. Um, on the upper right, you see the new inn. It's a hotel done by Mool and Polyzoides out of California. Um, our firm was responsible for restoration of the mansion, the chapel, and small additions to the chapel, a new restaurant, and uh, miscellaneous work at a new kitchen. And the pool, of course. Christy Tenite did the landscape architecture on this project. Um, every developer is a dreamer of some sort, but the developer and owner of this project was so intertwined. He was really a romantic visionary. It's Clark Lida. He grew up in Austin. He went to school at St. Mary's Academy and he developed just a deep love for this site. So this project is his brainchild and almost every historic project I think any of us have ever worked on is driven by passion. For some reason, it just speaks to the soul of the owner or the developer. And Clark had this vision for the site and he assembled a very solid development team here in Austin. Um, I, as you can see, the site sort of struggled with what it was going to be. And I do think it's found its final proper place of activity because even Commodore Perry himself is quoted to have said something along the lines of, it, didn't, it wasn't really easy to live in, but it was a great place to have a party. So I hope you will all I'll go over there and see the hotel, eat in the restaurant. And now Delia is gonna tell us a lot about our process followed by Holly. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so there's a few images here that we're gonna go through relatively quickly. And these are um, additional historic photographs um, from the late 1930s and early 1940s. And um, one of the major first steps in our process are always to go and, and look up the history of the project. So just as Emily told the story, we go to the THC, we go to the Austin History Center, we look up different zoning and permitting, and just try and find all the information that we can. Um, and what's really helpful about this is finding these historic photographs. Um, and then the second step of our process, which you'll see here, is documenting uh, the existing conditions of the building. Um, and so we do this in multiple ways. This way is basically we've gone on site and we've um, measured every wall, every ceiling. Um, we've taken thorough photographs of each room and each um, space. Another way that we've done it also as well is with um, 3D laser scanning photography. Um, so that is newer technology that we've uh, been, been utilizing in historic projects as well. 
You can go to the next slide. Um, this project was really unique because it was relatively intact. There weren't a lot of holes for us to look into and, and find out about the structure. So we engaged with Burnish and Plum Construction and they came and helped us do selective demolition to really get a thorough analysis of what was there. Um, we needed really detailed information of all the sizes of every single structure, the depth of the crawl space, the sizes of the beams, um, in order to accommodate all the new loads, um, all the new mechanical systems that we were planning to install on this project. Can we go to the next slide. So a little bit of technical information. This project did get um, all new um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems that got new fire sprinkler systems. And so we utilized the spaces that were already there, um, but we also um, had to excavate in order to accommodate a lot of this information, uh, uh, a lot of these systems. And Rogers O'Brien had to um, come in and hand dig under the crawl space in order to accommodate uh, these systems. Um, so this is an image of the crawl space duct plan. The first floor was completely fed through the crawl space. So all of these systems had to fit under there. Go to the next slide. Um, as you'll see, we do a thorough 3D model of the building after we've documented the building. And so this helps us to integrate um, all the new structural components, all the new mechanical components. And you'll see that um, we also work with consultants who model these items three-dimensionally and so we can fit them into any unique space, any space that's been um, abandoned. And so you'll see on the top image on the right, um, we utilize an old duct, um, I'm sorry, an old fireplace shaft in order to um, bring some uh, outside air into the second floor space. That was formally uh, cooled with um, like window units. Can go to the next slide. So here's just an image. You'll see it looks very nice in here, but we wanted to minimize any kind of um, uh, damage to the existing ornate wall paneling. And so you'll see how they integrated uh, new uh, wall vents into the here. And so the, the air is basically coming from underneath the crawl space into this uh, library space. Can go to the next slide. And then same here, you'll see we had a very um, ornate ceiling that we wanted to preserve. And so you'll see that the fire sprinkler systems are there, but they're very minimal. And those had to be installed from above in order to maintain the existing historic ceilings. You can go to the next slide. Um, a lot of the buildings had very decorative plaster work, um, and this was very important work and if you, uh, very important to maintain. So all of this was original. If you go to the next slide. And you'll see here how Rogers O'Brien took, uh, took quite a bit of time to tape out exactly where all of our um, penetrations were going and they made sure to consult with the architect just to find the perfect space in order to place that um, on these uh, unique ceilings. Can we go to the next slide. And here you can see them uh, taping out uh, the fire sprinkler systems and the new HVAC uh, uh, shafts. You can go to the next slide. And then I'm gonna pass this over to Holly Arthur and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about the project. Thanks, Delia. Hey, everybody. Uh, these next two slides show the, the floor plans of uh, the new uh, layout of the mansion. Um, and this also includes the furniture um, layout from Ken Folk, our um, design out of California. They, um, they were the interior architects on the project. The, the major changes that were done in the mansion was um, in the upper left corner where uh, you see some restrooms that used to be the existing service kitchen. 
and um, we were no longer going to be utilizing that as a kitchen. So we turned it into public restrooms and then um, used the existing service hall to become the, the corridor to lead you back to those restrooms. Uh, but everything else generally was left as its current use for this project, um, meaning we kept the dining hall, the dining hall, the breakfast room, the breakfast room, the living room, the living room, and so on. You can go to the next slide, Julie. This is the second floor plan. It had five suites originally, and we kept those five suites, and you can now go and stay in these five suites um, if you so choose. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, we did uh, modernize them some by um, uh, just updating the bathrooms, doing small changes um, with you know sink layouts and toilet layouts, but generally speaking, um, it uh, does keep to uh, its original uh, use and um, uh, layouts of, of the original suites. Next slide, Julie. So some of the, the things that we uh, faced during the construction was uh, water mitigation. So we had some um, areas where there was water damage and we needed to uh, find its source and, and mitigate that. And one of these items was the fountain that is on the loggia on the west, excuse me, the east side. Um, we needed to open up the interior wall to really explore what was happening here. And you can see by the image on the left, there was um, damage to the, the framing inside the pipe was leaking. So we needed to remove the pipe and replace that and reconnect it, then um, update the waterproofing to the fountain. Well, rather, I should say, add some waterproofing to the fountain basin on the exterior. Next slide, Julie. Julie, are you able to go to the next slide? There we go. So you can see on the right, this is a historic photo of the loggia um, looking down towards that fountain. And on the left, we have a drawing uh, showing some details of how they were to um, carefully remove some of the um, plaster work and um, put some waterproofing on the exterior of the wall and then um, recreate some, um, some cast stone pieces to cover waterproofing inside the basin of the fountain. Next slide. So around the exterior of the mansion, there are many uh, cast stone elements, quite a variety of them. Uh, one of these includes the balustrade on the south side that extends uh, from the mansion all the way to um, the, the east side of the property and at the top of the historic gardens. Um, you can see that the balustrade was in um, uh, not in good shape. It was um, deteriorating and uh, some of the balusters were uh, just missing entirely. So we removed one of these balusters and had um, a cast uh, created to uh, recreate these and install them back to their original convention. Um, we used Centennial Moisture Control out of Dallas to help um, with the cast stone work. Next slide. Another challenge we uh, faced uh, in the mansion um, included uh, a, an addition of a small commercial kitchen in the basement. So the basement was originally, um, it originally housed, you can see sort of like the laundry area. You can see there's that uh, three compartment sink there. And then it also housed a boiler, which 
In the lower um, right picture, if you look through that doorway there, the boiler sits in there. Um, we removed that. Obviously, we were not going to reuse a boiler here, so we installed all new mechanical systems, as Delia touched on earlier. Um, one of the challenges uh, with putting this commercial kitchen inside the basement was uh, just how we would uh, install a commercial hood. Originally, it was planned to use a recirculating hood, but that proved to be rather expensive. So we value engineered it to a more conventional hood that used uh, an exhaust. Uh, so we needed to go back to the Historic Landmark Commission to discuss the location of this exhaust. And we looked at a couple of locations, one of them being on the roof and one of them being on an exterior wall. Um, because one of the more important things uh, for the Historic Landmark Commission was um, the view from the street and uh, the front lawn, we chose to not put it on the roof and uh, instead put it on uh, the sidewall. Julie, if you go to the next slide, you can see the, the hood there on the, uh, the left, which is the west side of the mansion. Um, we, of course, we painted it the same color of the walls um, in, in order to, uh, you know, try to blend it in. Um, really, you have to walk around this side, which is not um, a side that's used a lot by the public um, to really see that, that hood. So we, we feel like this was the, the best location to place that exhaust. Next slide. Another element to the development um, included a pool. Um, hotel, um, you, you need a pool. And uh, this gorgeous oval-shaped pool was designed by Tonight Landscape Architects. And um, they uh, found what I think is the best location for this pool on the site, which is in the lower west portion of the front lawn. Um, again, Historic Landmark Commission um, wanted to discuss the, the pool and its location, and um, their main concern were, again, the sight lines to the mansion and that south loggia from the lawn and 41st Street. If you go to the next slide. This diagram done by Tonight, Tonight Landscape Architects um, shows those sight lines from 41st Street looking up to the mansion. You can see that the pool, again, is tucked down in the lower portion of that lawn to help uh, with those sight lines. And if you go to the next slide, here's um, an image of standing from the pool looking up at the mansion. You can see that. Um, it's definitely um, set low enough to give you that, um, the, the wide view of the mansion there. Next slide. Lastly, one of the things that I wanted to touch on is the, uh, one of the new buildings on the site, which is the newly opened restaurant Ludie's, which um, interestingly enough is named after the wife of Edgar Perry, who, uh, originally built uh, the mansion and the estate. Um, this building is situated at the west of the site and abuts the historic stone wall surrounding the property. This building was designed to be a blank canvas for fig ivy to envelop and disappear into the gardens, sort of like a garden folly. It's meant to feel like it's a part of the grounds. And while inside the restaurant, you can see the historic stone wall running inside the dining room. If you go to the next slide. This is an image of um, a portion of the stone wall that needed to be um, rebuilt. So we tried to match um, some of the, the, the patterning of that stone wall. That's um, the image on the right. And then the image on the left is a detail of us of, uh, from the drawing showing um, how we needed to um, carefully look at how we would cantilever the stucco wall over the stone wall. And AEC um, uh, designed the steel to hang from the roof above. And um, 
Acton Partners was the waterproofing consultant on this pro project. And they um, carefully helped us um, you know, with this detail, looking at ways to control moisture coming from the exterior of the stone wall into the restaurant. And we did this um, with a couple of uh, ways. We used a siloxane, um, let's see, it's a, it's a siloxane, I think, silane blend of sealer on the exterior of the wall. It's um, non-staining. And then uh, Acton also came out with a rillum test, which is essentially a tube that you stick, shoot water through to penetrate the wall to see that it is indeed doing its job. And, um, and then additionally, we embedded the flashing on top of the stone wall in a non-staining sealant. Next slide. This is an image showing the stone wall exposed on the inside. Next slide. This is an, another image on the interior, um, looking back at the bar. And the idea is that um, the restaurant is, again, you know, it's abutting the garden. It's supposed to be um, a, you know, feeling like you're inside the garden. So there's a trellis above that hides all of the mechanical systems. And, um, and then there's plants hanging from it. And in fact, today, if you go, you would see that they've added just that many more plants and greenery inside. It's quite um, lovely and romantic. Next slide. You can start to see the addition of more plants here. And um, we, we added a lot of windows to this uh, restaurant um, and to the walls that overlook the historic um, gardens. Next slide. This is sitting out um, on the terrace of the garden restaurant, or Ludi's rather, looking out over the estate. Next slide. This is standing inside the Italianate gardens, looking back at the chapel and the new restaurant, and then beyond to the inn. Next slide. This is also standing in the historic gardens, looking back at the, at the mansion and chapel, and then you can see the pool to the, um, all the way over to the left. Next slide. Looking back at the mansion, next. This is uh, looking at what's now the used as the main entry into the mansion. One of those urns there, interestingly enough, was, um, was not there when we started this project and we took the existing urn and recreated that. Next slide. Another view, next. This is the South Loja. We did add, um, at the, in the distance beyond, we did add a trellis covering the, the walkway between the breakfast terrace and this main um, terrace at the south. Next slide. This is standing at the garden, or excuse me, the breakfast terrace, looking back into the breakfast room. Next slide. Uh, the picture on the right is the main hall, and to the to the left is um, looking up from uh, the lobby space and uh, up into the oval stair. Um, the interior design team, Ken Polk, had a muralist um, paint uh, this beautiful mural at the top. Next slide. This is standing, both of these images are in the oval room, which was also considered the library. Next slide. This is the dining room. Um, the, uh, the walls were actually originally um, dark walnut paneling and um, the 
the interior design team had a, uh, an artist come in and uh, brighten it up with um, faux wood paint. So it may look real, but when you get really close, you can start to see the fine detail of the paint on these walls. Next slide. These are images both in the living room. Um, the right is the addition of the service bar. Next slide. This is inside the solarium. Everything is original except for the furniture and the drapes. Next slide. This is upstairs in the sitting room. Um, Generally, um, only guests are allowed to sit in here now, um, but perhaps if you, if you go, um, just try to sneak your way up the oval stairs and you can see this gorgeous wallpaper. Next slide. This is inside um, Mrs. Perry's suite. Um, so she has um, a large uh, living area and through that door beyond is the bedroom. Next slide. This is inside um, Edgar Jr.'s suite. Um, he also has a sitting room in his room and through the door on the left is the bedroom. Next slide. This is uh, the Hal Thompson suite. Um, you may recall Emily speaking about the um, original architect and um, he was honored with um, one of the suites getting named after. Next slide. This is standing in the Italianate Gardens. Looking back at the chapel, you can see a small addition um, on the left that includes uh, some more public restrooms. The chapel is mainly used um, as a bed space. Next slide. This is uh, an image of the carriage house. Um, very little was done um, here to the carriage house. Uh, we, the, the only additions that we did was to add um, the railings. You can see at the top, um, we just added some small railings to help bring that up to code. Next slide. Oh, and that's it. Thanks everybody. I'll hand this back over to Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Um... Emily, Holly, Delia, Terry, Ellen, those were all really wonderful, fascinating presentations, amazing projects, amazing. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes for questions and we have a few. I will kick the first one to Ellen. Um, you're being asked, are shelter houses primarily in Texas or are they found in other parts of the United States or internationally? Um, well, there's definitely a movement um, throughout the nation for um, increasing recreation as leisure time um, increased at the, um, in the 20s and 30s. There was development in the national parks and the state parks. Um, and we see a lot of construction that was done by the New Deal um, work programs, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, the Civil Works Administration, the National Youth Administration, and those started in the mid 30s and um, can be seen throughout the country. Um, so not particular to Austin or to Texas. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, we have another question, I think, for everybody. And Ellen, you touched a little bit on this in your presentation about what's the situation with specialty crafts and restoration? The person asking the question is from Germany and they're experiencing a drop in interest in building and restoration crafts. I'll, I'll answer briefly. Um, I, I think that it's always um, an issue. And um, I think that, you know, because these, these projects are so specific and, and the craftsmanship that is needed and the materials that are needed to be matched um, are, are often unique um, difficult. Each situation calls for um, a unique look and um, skill. Um, we, we constantly have that problem, I think, in Austin. Um, and, and we just need to draw from wherever the skill exists. And um, 
And we know we have a lot of um, good contractors, but they do travel throughout Texas to work on these special projects. I'll let everybody else answer too. Um, we, I, I agree with everything Ellen just said. I know that there's an interest locally in starting a trade school for, um, for people to learn building trades at the high school level. And that's really interesting, but I'll, I'll turn it to the uh, Emily's team here for an answer also. Emily, would you like to answer that? Well, I, I don't know. I, mean, I think it's always a struggle. I really do. It's, uh, I do think I, I see more interest in artisan, the work of artisans and younger people today, which is very exciting to see. But uh, there, I think the contractors that have really the best experience are getting fewer and far between. It's a special, a special person that can really do a restoration project. Thank you. Um, for the Perry team, uh, who uses the Commodore Perry House now? Is it for hotel guests? Holly? Sure, I can answer that. Yes, um, it's, it's uh, mainly hotel guests. There is a small club component to private club component um, where you can become a member. Um, and the restaurant is also open to the public via res uh, reservations. Wonderful. Um, one question for the Perry as well was RO, I believe that's Rogers O'Brien, retained during design as CM? Uh, they came on later in the project, um, towards the end of design. Um, they, there was not a construction manager. And in fact, there was a project manager throughout the majority of the project. They came on, you know, um, during the design process. Um, originally, it was Woodbine and then later switched to Greenbrier during construction. And uh, Holly, could you just say a little bit about the complexity of all that went on at the site at the same time for Rogers O'Brien? Oh, sure. They had a tough job. They um, not only, you know, were there two architects on the job. It was, you know, a whole, it was a campus-wide project and there were multiple consultants that, um, you know, they, they were um, wrangling, let's say. Um, and, you know, they, they had a large development team and um, large consultant team that, uh, you know, they needed to send RFIs out to everyone. Um, the project manager definitely was there to to back them, but uh, their job was um, quite challenging. I don't think that they realized, you know, the management that they would need to do um, for this job, but they did a great job. And we have um, Christine Shank from Rogers O'Brien saying in the chat, thank you for the beautiful projects. Rogers O'Brien was so fortunate to have taken part in the restoration and addition of the Perry Mansion. I'm happy to show it to anyone in our community. Please reach out and she has her email. Uh, in the Q&A if you are anybody's interested. Just got that offered up. Um, we have one last question about the Buwas house. So it's, it's, what is its current use and can it be visited or toured? It is a, it is a private residence. Um, the family is very, very private. Um, I've not known them to want to open it up for tours, unfortunately. That might change in the future. I know that um, they, they really, uh, they, they are glad that everyone appreciates the house, but it's not open for tours. It's a shame. I mean, understandable, but we'll, we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can work on that. A little bit. And we just have also a lot of effusive praise for all of your presentations in the chat as well. Inspiring projects. Thank you for the stimulating presentations and level of detail. Um, and another one that just says three fantastic projects, which I cannot agree with more. So with mm -hmm. that, I will say thank you all for being in attendance tonight, for presenting, for your time, and for your, um, for your wonderful insights. And uh, Preservation Austin is so grateful to you and to AA Austin and Austin Foundation for Architecture uh, for co-hosting this event with us tonight. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you so much. That was thank wonderful. You. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Bye. Bye. <laughs>